Uh, thanks very much, Michael. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the IVI webinar on ISO 19650. This is another webinar from the IVI webinar series organizing by Innovation Value Institute, IVI at Manute University. For today, we are going to talk about ISO 19650, and uh, we will have four speakers uh, from industry and practice. We will have an interesting discussion at the end of the speaks uh, related to the topics for uh, practical insight and also the Irish Annex. I'm going to introduce each of the speakers and also we are going to have the uh, 20 minutes of speaks by each of the uh, speakers. Uh, you could write down your questions in the text box, uh, in the chat box, and also the webinar is going to be recorded and will be available on the IBI webpage. And now our first speaker is Michael Early. Uh, he is a big manager working with Dublin Airport since 2019 and is a member of the digital transformation team responsible for the uh, delivery of the airport capital investment uh, program. Michael is responsible for the implementation of the BIM uh, strategy and integration of systems to ensure seamless transfer of information during the full life cycle of the physical and digital assets. Part of the strategy is to deliver projects in according with ISO 19650 standard and utilize digital tools to improve the quality of information that is used to design. A design, construct, construct, operate, and maintain uh, assets. And just mentioning that all the speakers for this webinar and also myself, we are members of uh, National Standards Authority of Ireland, NSAI. And over to Michael. Floor is yours, Michael. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Can't... Just trying to share my screen and uh, it's not allowing me. Um, uh, you might do it now because- I yes, I can, yes, I can do it now, perfect. And, right. All right, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, okay. So I titled my presentation, where should you start when tender and using ISO 19650 part two standard? I think that's, uh, uh, starting out on a project well is really the key to doing it and uh, you'll see from my presentation hopefully that uh, very much the, um, the start of um, uh, projects in accordance with 19650 uh, standards really starts with the client. Uh, it cannot not start without the client. Okay, so just to give you a bit of my background, Ben Manager DA, so a member of a digital team, transformation team, so basically uh, we, we have a number of digital projects to do with GIS, sort of uh, FM systems, uh, IoT and so on, and uh, BIM is uh, part of that and uh, I look after that. Also chair of the ARI AI BIM committee, we've uh, published uh, some documents, uh, the, the largest one being the BIM pack, and uh, we're doing an update to that at the moment to align with 19650. Uh, significant amount of work in that. And uh, also we are at the final stages of producing a guidance document and file naming, and also um, in accordance with the Irish National Annex, um, and also a, a guide for small practices. Um, so my background, education is computer science and also architectural technology. So it's kind of a good combination, I think, uh, for Ben. And, uh, I spent about 20 years in a delivery role and now I'm on the, the client side trying to bring some of that knowledge uh, to that side of things. So I've been working in BIM since 2012. Okay, so this is uh, this slide is courtesy of uh, ArcDocs um, and Ralph will be going into a little bit more detail on this. Um, ISO 19650 is very much a prescribed uh, system for uh, curing uh, or tendering uh, uh, projects and it deals with the information delivery as part of those projects. Uh, it's divided into uh, eight sort of uh, stages, if you want to call it that. So the ones I'm going to look at here at the very beginning are assessment and need and invitation to tender. So I'm not going to go through 
the rest of them, although there are sections uh, along the way that's uh, particularly getting towards the uh, project closeout uh, that again, um, the appointing party uh, gets involved in. Uh, just to make a note, uh, I will refer to it as appointing party. Uh, that's often can be referred to another set so of documentation as client or employer. Uh, that's the term used in the actual uh, 19650 standard. Uh, it also, the other uh, um, uh, role I'll be sort of mentioning is a prospective uh, lead appointed party. So a lead appointed party is someone that the appointing party has a contract with. So traditionally that would be client and uh, consultant, the client and uh, contractor. So just to give you sort of a, an insight in just what the standard is about, because I think they're often daunting at the beginning. So um, in, if you download and have a look at the ISO standard, uh, it's both, there's an Irish version of it, which is ISEN 19650 part two. Uh, there's also a BS uh, uh, EN ISO uh, document. They're exactly the same, apart from the number. The only difference is the national annex and uh, Rich is going to discuss that later on. So in the document, it, it sees uh, BIM as being a, a process. So that's uh, so it's called an information management process. And this is something that uh, is, I think it's the way it's going. BIM has been around and it's been a kind of a name that's uh, used quite a lot, but uh, I can see that the, the terminology is really going towards information management uh, on design and construction. Uh, so. So it's termed information management process during the delivery phase of, of assets. Um, there's a number of sub processes defined in the document. And uh, the first one is, is assessment and need. That's really a client led uh, sub process. So that's one of the eight, that's the first one. And within each sub process then there's activities. And uh, the first one there is 5.1.1. First thing you have to do is point individuals to undertake the information management function. Um, so the very first step is that the client needs to have someone on their side to manage information on a project for them. So if you intend to do a project, whether it's an office building or a, an airport terminal or whatever, uh, you need uh, someone to review the, uh, the information requirements for that project and to assist you in basically uh, preparing the tender documentation so that it meets the requirements, information requirements. Uh, so that's the first activity. So as part of assessment and need, there are eight uh, activities and that's what I'm gonna concentrate on for this. So, so the first one is to appoint individuals. Um, so there's a few options here. Um, and uh, option one is you nominate an individual within your company. So I work for DA, I'm generally the nominated individual. Uh, uh, to undertake the sort of information management function on behalf of the client. Not all clients will have someone inside. Uh, uh, it depends very much on <clears throat> how uh, mature you are in terms of BIM, but also what size the project is, is it one off and so on. Uh, option two is to outsource. So you can outsource in two ways. Uh, this is what the standard states. So basically you can appoint the prospective lead appointed party or you can appoint a third party. So, uh, and this is really important. You need to establish the scope of services if you're going to do that. So you need to say what they're going to do as part of the, um, uh, the process. So what it does do is it gives you an appendix A at the end, which basically has all the uh, 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 sub processes and activities all listed out and you tick off the ones that uh, are relevant uh, to uh, the uh, organization or individual that's going to undertake that for you. Um, so this is very much a, um, a person rather than a, maybe a company, but uh, when you're outsourcing this, you need to look at the individual's capability, uh, either the individual or the individual within that company to undertake the, that information management function. Okay. So second thing is to establish the project information requirements. Um, this is basically the brief uh, for the project, but you now need to look at it from a sort of a project management and an asset management sort of uh, point of view. So uh, I would have to look through the brief, let's say uh, on a project, and I'd have to start to look and say, right, what are we actually asking for here? Are we clear about exactly what we're asking for? You can say you want a building, but if you want a building to, uh, let's say, 
um, uh, be lead compliant or billing to do certain things, let's say like uh, do a certain amount of passengers per year. How do we know that's, uh, when we get that, how do we know we got it? Um, uh, so that's a very high level requirement, but you can get into more detailed requirements. Like you might say, we want uh, two area handling units and we need to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you need to have some assurance that that's happening. So you've got to go through the actual requirements that you put in and try and break it down into what information, what's needed and what information is needed for each of those. So just an example there, uh, just a, a text that may be in a sort of a brief so the contractor shall submit a completed asset register for mechanical equipment. So it's a schedule of all the equipment uh, based on project, project information standards. So that might be a document that states what you need um, uh, and a template which you may provide. Um, uh, and that's stored in the shared resources on the common data environment. So the asset register shall be submitted to the appointing party for review and acceptance. So I've highlighted all the things in blue which I'd start to see submitted. How does that happen? Uh, appointing party, that's someone that's going to, it's going to be submitted to someone in the appointing party, which is the client. Got to figure out who that is. Uh, is that just generally the, the, the client itself? Or is that particular individuals that need to look at that? So I'd say, look, this is m &E. that needs to go to certain people on this project. Does it need to go to a wider group to make sure that it uh, meets all requirements uh, for the organization? You have to decide that. Review and acceptance is a process. So how do we know, um, how do we push that through a process that where it can be reviewed and how do we know it's accepted? How do we differentiate between information that's not accepted and, and information that's accepted? And when does all this happen as well? So at what stage? Uh, so this is the kind of things you've got to start thinking about. It's, um, it's far more detailed than you would normally. So, and it's good because you start to think about how the process works. So you don't, you're not working out as you go along. So there are many sort of things that need to be sorted out in projects. Uh, how the planning documentation works for safety, safety, disability, how BCAR will be presented. Handover documentation is quite significant. Um, uh, memory health and safety plans, risk assessments, method statements, how do inspections works, and so on. So uh, how are you going to get all that information? Who's going to assess it? Uh, what format is going to come in and so on? So just to give you an example, just uh, one thing for us that's really big is acid re registers. So acid registers are schedules essentially. So we have a requirement to get information about certain things that are important to us. And uh, we need to decide what's important. Uh, it could be an air handling unit and the socket on the wall might be not important. Um, but again, rooms might be important um, that we have an up-to-date register of all those, who's in them, uh, who owns them, uh, uh, what tenant is in those rooms and so on. And if that room disappears, uh, that we know or gets merged with another room or gets demolished as part of the building being taken down, that we know that's uh, taken off our asset list. So we're starting to look at assets. And uh, this is just, that's just an example, just a sort of information we start to look at. We said at the very beginning, we have a small amount of information about an asset. We just need to know it exists really. Um, when was it, when is it created or when was it demolished? Uh, is it classified? Um, we use a fairly simple classification system. It's in plain English. This is our Maximo FM system. Uh, air handling unit is called an air handling unit. Uh, doors go into doors and so on. There, there's, a, there's a breakdown of all those. And as we get into construction then, we want more information. We're now starting to look at uh, manufacturer model and so on. So that's one of our information requirements is these asset registers. And uh, we define a sort of a methodology for how we get that information. Another thing that's important for us is uh, inspections. So we need to know that they're happening. We need to know that the contractors have a plan of what inspections to do on their subcontractors work. And we need to know when issues arise out of those inspections, are they being dealt with and uh, how quickly they're starting to be dealt with. So you're now starting to get into the sort of um, the data side of things. You need to start asking, right, how do we know all this is happening? How do we know they're getting closed out in a certain amount of time? How many health and safety issues have we got left over? And how many are quality, how many are environmental and so on? So you need to start to um, uh, define the information in, in those terms and not just for ourselves, but to make sure everyone else knows that that's how we actually uh, define information for projects. 
So that's uh, information requirements. So then we've got to establish the project information delivery milestones. This is essentially uh, a plan of work. So what are your stages you're working to on the project? An example down below is RIBA, but it could be RIAI, government GCC contracts, it could be your own bespoke system. In the airport, we have a, a bespoke system, uh, a little bit similar to the RIBA, but there's, there are slight differences. Um, it actually confuses people. I think it would have been better if we stuck with an industry standard. Um, but anyway, what we need to align with those then is deliverables at each point here. And those then, you start to look at them and say, right, how do we know who's going to check these when they come in? How do we know uh, the meter requirements and so on? So this is really important that you define uh, those stages and what you're going to get at each stage. Some of those things you might get them at this stage, you might get updated at that stage, or you may just get them one off at that stage. So, so the project, two key documents then that go out as part of our tender, and one of them is the project information standard. And think of this as a glorified CAD standard, if you want to call it that. Uh, except there's a lot more information in it. So uh, we will set out basically in that document, it's really about what is to be done. So we'll set out um, why we need the information, uh, what we're going to do with the information, what we expect the information to be used for during the project. So why would we need it? We need it to on and operate the building, and we might use it for uh, to integrate some IoT information into it as well, uh, into other things. Um, during the project, we might expect that information to be used for uh, analyzing maybe can that building uh, or that structure, existing structure, hold up the extra equipment that's going on to the building. So if we convey that to the engineers, then they can say, right, now we're looking at doing structural an analysis on the building. So it's not just a, a Revit model. Um, so it will define the level of detail, level of information, uh, the coordinate system. So we're using ITM coordinate systems in, in the airport, and uh, that's a particular coordinate system. So we want to know if we pick a point there, it relates exactly to this point here. So that's harder than you might think to get right. Um, so on a campus building uh, site, you really need that to be well refined. What software formats we want to work with? Uh, how do we do file name and revision control? And that'll uh, feed into the national annex. Uh, how we want information presented, what fonts, logos, sheets should we use, what colors, uh, where should key plans go. We're getting into that level of detail. Then for CAD, what's the standards, for BIM, what the standards are. So, um, so we're getting into that level of detail. So that's the project information standards. So that's about what's on uh, documents, what's in models, what's in tangible things that you can pick up and, and, and look at. Um, so that's really important. There's another document that's really important, and that's the project information production methods and procedures. And this is really about the how. Uh, how do you do surveys? Uh, how do you generate, review, and improve information? How do you federate models? Uh, how do you do class reduction? Um, how do you, um, how's the common data environment run and set up? Um, how do you distribute information? Uh, and so on. So it's about the how. So it's, it's a like if you're, if any of you have a, an ISO 9001 standard, it's like, um, it's like, um, uh, what are they called? They're, they're called methods or uh, work methods or work procedures. Uh, so it's how you do things. So big thing for us is this handover information, uh, how we get information here in the format we want. Uh, and we're really at the moment now, really, that's almost, we, everyone sees it at the end of their head, the really needs to be seen that from the beginning. So another thing that's uh, important is the reference information. And um, so I'm just been setting up a project this morning and what we're doing is we'll set up folders on the common data environment. And we'll put up any relevant as built records, surveys, residual risks from uh, previous or adjacent construction projects, templates, uh, existing asset information. So anything that's relevant to the project team uh, that will be made available to them. It's possible that this could actually be made available to uh, tenders as well uh, to aid them in sort of a costing the project. Common data environment. Um, the, it's basically the client's responsibility to make sure that the uh, common data environment is set up if you're running a project on 19650. Uh, there is an option to um, uh, outsource that to a third party. Um, 
And again, there needs to be a scope uh, done for that. So it needs to be very clear what they're doing. Are they hosting it, um, managing it, uh, uh, looking after permissions, setting up users and so on. Um, so there's quite a lot in that. And uh, so it's, um, there is an option in there as well. If you do have a common data environment set up to transfer to your lead appointed party, my advice, I suppose, for any clients that have a lot of projects is they need to run themselves. Uh, it's their information. Um, uh, but I can see on a one-off project why you might um, uh, want maybe a third party or um, uh, uh, one of the lead uh, appointed parties to do that. <clears throat> so there is some criteria in the standard for a CDE. And you can have a look at that in the standard. Uh, some basic things like uh, it needs a support file naming. Um, suitability of information uh, and so on. Project information protocol. So this is a document uh, I don't see too often, but it is very important if you're, uh, especially if you're uh, a client with a lot of assets. Um, it really deals with sort of three major issues. And it's a lot in it, but three major issues. One is intellectual property rights. Who owns the information? Um, the, um, the responsibility of the appointed parties, so subcontractors to adhere to the same standards as the lead appointed party. So when we engage a lead appointed party, which could be a designer contractor, we want to make sure that their subcontractors are doing uh, producing information to our standards as well. So it puts an onus on them to do that. And it deals with resolution in the event of a dispute or termination of appointment contract and also to do with uh, who owns the models uh, or the information after that. And so that document, it is a document uh, that the UK BIM framework have produced. It's a very good document, has guidance in it as well. That's worth a read. Um, and uh, I think if you read through the guidance, uh, you might uh, change your mind on how important a protocol is on a project. Um, so I'm only going to just, uh, just go through these in, uh, in an overview. Um, so the second part is invitation to tenders. So, after we've done all that, and that's a lot of work to have done, um, and very much um, as part of my role, I would have a lot of that done and most of it ready um, for the next project. Not all of it is. Um, so the first thing when I start and uh, someone says, oh, another project going out the door, I need to establish the exchange information requirements document. So that's a document that describes for this project uh, what we need. So that's my one minute bell, I suppose. Uh, so the um, so I don't need to describe that again, but really we need to define what's particular to this project. Um, what information we need first, what will we accept uh, or how will we accept or reject that information. And we need to pull in the, um, what we need to support that. And also what is the delivery milestones for all that. So you could do that all that out potentially in a sort of a, a plan of work uh, where you define all those things. Um, establish the shared resources that I explained that before. That's to, on the common data environment. Now that you've identified the shared resource you need, put it up there and share it. Um, and uh, the tender response requirements. What do you expect back from the delivery team? So you want their pre-appointment BIM execution plan, CV for the individual taking on the information management function on behalf of the delivery team. That's different to the client team. Uh, uh, you want to understand the delivery team's capability and capacity. So can they do it? So a statement basically of their experience managing projects uh, in BIM. Uh, you want a mobilization plan and a risk assessment. Mobilization is how will they, what will they do in the first two to six weeks, getting the project running? And what are the risks with information? Uh, maybe we've asked for too much. Uh, maybe it can't be delivered in that time. And then you complete the invitation to tender. Um, so those are the documents that go out with that. I just now I'm running tight in time. So uh, just two couple of last comments. So when you're going out, don't tender using level two BIM or BIM level two. That was the PAS standard. You should tender now using uh, BIM accordance with according in accordance with the ISO 19650 series. Not sufficient for a client to state they want BIM. Uh, you need to actually follow the steps in ISO 19650. Uh, and you need to be very familiar with those steps. And uh, there is no option to omit any of the steps. You need to look at each of them. There is a, a shall consider 
um, a statement in there, and those things you can consider to leave in or out, uh, but it does say that you should uh, strongly, strongly suggest you should consider them. Um, so my challenges are uh, ISO 19650 is very prescriptive about tendering, but it's not great on delivery. Um, uh, clients need to be aware of what information is required from the start. That's not easy. Um, the amount of information required even for a small building uh, is now substantial and we need to be avoiding manual processing of information uh, where we can. Uh, there needs to be, I think, some incentives um, for the general industry to produce better quality information. Um, uh, otherwise, you're doing a lot of checking and there's few people to do that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, reliance at the moment on individuals, is my experience, uh, to do, who are very good at modeling, data management, surveying, clash detection, integration of field-based activities and document control. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure because these are now the hot sort of uh, um, uh, points, I suppose, in construction. But in future, we're gonna have a requirement for a much better sort of integration, quantification, program analytics, and, uh, uh, and data analytics into modeling and so on. So that's it, my fine. That. Yeah, thanks very much, Michael, for the interesting presentation and introducing the standard. And now we are going to switch to our second speaker, who is Rich De Palma. And I'm going to have a short introduction to Rich. Uh, Rich is the director of digital design and construction company, the DPW Group. And uh, DPW provides model uh, production coordination, DDC project and organization implementation, project management, support and training services to a variety of industry stakeholders. Rick's hands on uh, approach enables him to target practical benefits and address the real project challenges associated with the digitization of the construction industry. He has led the DPW team to deliver project and company digital implementation plans, develop highly effective information management workflows and help organization achieve BIM certification. Rich is a member of NSAI and also he has been led the lead member of the uh, team to develop Irish Annex for ISO 19650. I'm going to hand it over to Rich. Over to you, Rich. Thank you. You're on mute, Rich. There we go. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Zara, for, uh, for the introduction. The, so, yeah, the focus of uh, this presentation will be uh, looking at the key objectives uh, that were put in place for the National Annex. The, uh, a little bit about myself, the, uh, as, as has already said, uh, director of DPW Group, um, there's a few, few items listed there. The probably the, the most relevant item that's on this list uh, for this presentation would be being the convener for the subcommittee in the development of the National Annex. Um, while that said, the, uh, as we go through this presentation, the, uh, aside from the, any quotes or factual items from the, from the standard, or the National Annex. The, um, the views expressed here would be my own. I'm not representing the NSAI uh, in that capacity. The, so we'll jump straight into it. And first thing is, is what is a National Annex? The, uh, so you know, the, the, the quote we have listed there uh, just is you know, the general quote that came from the, uh, the scope document or the scope section of the National Annex. The, uh, and we're looking to give guidance for the implementation of the standard, you know, the base standard being ISEN, uh, ISO 19650-2, 2018. The, so just, just to be, be clear to everybody and what a national annex can and can do, the, uh, it can provide clarification, guidance, or in requirements related to the standard at uh, a national level. The, um, key thing here is that what it can do is it can't change or contradict the base standard. So compliance with the, the base standard rests purely with the base standard. The, uh, what we've done here is looked at specific requirements for the national market the, uh, and to help with its implementation. The, um, and then I think that's, that's a key part that people do need to kind of recognize is that there's nothing in there that we've changed in terms of the, the, the base standard. 
Why was it needed? The um, so you know one of the reasons was to provide clarity for what is involved in 19650. The as Michael kind of went through his presentation, the um, he was focusing on a very significant you know, small part of it, but even within that, there was some very uh, kind of open items. The um, and and kind of things that are very project specific. The um, so what we would look to do is to prov provide some clarity on some of those items. The, um, so that we would come up with a standard that is applicable to the Irish market. The, um, in addition to, to, to the clarity, you'd be looking to provide uh, support for a national certification program. The NSAI does have a certification program for ISO 19650. The, it has been in, in a testing phase. The, uh, however, I believe you can contact the NSAI on a certification program directly. Um, I think another aspect of it is to, you know, see, you know, at a national level, kind of how we can actually help projects and help people, help the industry move forward with ISO 19650. The uh, so rather than taking a passive approach and just waiting for uh, other uh, markets to uh, produce their information and to kind of see what's best and pick and choose, the it was a decision to take a proactive approach. The, uh, so that we can kind of demonstrate that we're, you know, we, we have expertise the, within our market, the, we understand our market and how the implementation of BIM and information management would imp imp impact that, uh, this market. The, uh, so, so what's in the National Annex? So then we're, we're not going to cover kind of bit, you know, section by section and, and, and go into huge detail on what it is. Really what we want to be doing if in this presentation is just highlighting like we had there the, uh, the, the key objectives from it. The, uh, so, to, you know, to quote the scope for, for what it is, the, um, you know, in addition to the guidance for, for the implementation, the, um, we really what are focused on is the structure for field identification and metadata related to information containers and information exchange standards requirements. The, uh, so it's very targeted. It's very targeted to this specific thing uh, related to you know, field identification. A lot of people consider that uh, file naming, the, um, as well as the metadata associ associated with it, specifically revisions status um, and the classification for uh, for the information containers. The so other stuff that's in the, in the standard was was kind of seen as you know either being project specific the uh, or and we want to make sure that that was not included in the, the national annex scope. So we had a very targeted uh, set of, of of requirements and recommendations uh, with, that's within the national annex. Okay, so the first objective was to def define clarity with some of our definitions. The uh, so a process you know, kind of was gone through in kind of determining the um, the terminology that was used, the and explicitly stating what that uh, really meant. The um, so the specific terms that we, we focused on was was level, phase, program, spatial zone, stage, and some project. The uh, the reason why those you know were were, were there is is because we want to make sure that we didn't leave ambiguities within that document. The, um, some of the terms, the, uh, are terms that are used in other standards and those were taken. So we weren't redefining terms used in other information management or construction related standards. The, um, and any, you know, thing that, that was kind of introduced, the, uh, was explicitly defined. The one thing we want people definitely to do on this is, is to read them. The, uh, and really understand exactly what the definition that we have in the National Annex is. Uh, it's not only important for the National Annex, it's very important when you're looking at the standard in, in general. Uh, and look, and the reason for that is, you know, we, we, we in, in construction industry, we're used to certain terms and we may use those terms differently, you know, either on a project by project basis or organizational basis. The, but when they're referenced back in standards or the National Annex, uh, they mean something specific. The uh, so it, it's really to focus on when you know we stay stage. You know it's you know it's a very specific definition for how it relates to the national annex and how it relates back into the uh, into the to the base standard. The uh, 
so it, it's take the definition kind of, you know, as, as it stated, the, that looking into the definition or looking into different interpretations of it, the can lead you into potential trouble when understanding what the, the objective for, uh, the different aspects of the, the, the national annex. Uh, and again, as in the base standard, you know, with their definitions uh, as well. The, so, so one, one of the, the first items we, uh, we do provide recommendations for the, is the requirement to align stages the, with the information uh, management process activities that is listed in, uh, in the base standard. The, um, so one thing again, down to the clarification side of things, the is on the left-hand side the, uh, of the screen, the, uh, within, in blue, we have the information management processes that are defined in the base standard. The, uh, and what can get confusing is that when people tend to see those as project stages, uh, which they're not, right? You know, some, some things are similar, the, uh, and some of the terminology is similar, but there's specific activities that are associated with those actions within that, uh, with, with, within that process that really needs to feed into the, you know, the project work stages. The, so one thing we kind of look for is for people to, to map those, um, you know, Ideally, you'd be doing that kind of at early stage, the uh, under the client requirements, so that everybody understands the uh, what information management activities need to be done at the different stages. The um, so what we have in green and orange there would just be example work stages uh, that people would need to map the specific project requirements and their information management activities as is proposed for for that project to um, the contractual work stages. The, uh, that would be uh, that would be needed. Okay. The uh, the next key key objective was to again clarify and, and codify in a bit more clear way uh, information container uh, identification. The uh, so within the base standard uh, that's quoted there. Each information container has to have a unique ID. It's based uh, with a field based system. The, uh, and the, the requirement in the state base standard is it for it to be an agreed and documented. The, so really from, from a national annex point of view is we're providing that, um, documented convention, uh, for, for, for people to, to incorporate the, um, and in addition to that, each of those fields has to come from a codification standard, which again is provided within the, uh, within the national annex. The, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of fields there. The, um, that, that are put forward within in the national annex. Uh, a lot of this should look familiar, you know, it's similar, uh, to the people that have kind of looked at PES 1192 or the UK national annex, uh, previously, there are some differences. The, um, so we, we two levels of, uh, of, uh, of a field is, is provided, uh, one we have that are, should be used and one should be used if applicable. The, uh, so there's a recognition here that certain projects, the, uh, may be less complex, the some are more complex, and some of those fields may be relevant to, to certain projects for a smaller project. Some of those may not be, uh, may not be relevant. The, or certain types of projects, uh, may be more, maybe linear in nature and don't have uh, a level. The, uh, for, for example, the, uh, or something that needs to be, you know, defined, uh, with a level field. The, or the same thing with element or system or spatial zone, uh, or the sub project, the, so the, so the intention for, you know, that's here is that this is what this would be the, the, the file naming convention that would be, or con information container naming convention, uh, that we use for projects. Again, depending on the project, you would either add or omit the, the, the ones that the items that are outlined in, in gray. Uh, they're also outlined in gray in the national annex. Um, two to kind of, you know, deviations for, for people that may have had experience with the, the UK national annex or the, the, the previous PES 1192 standard, uh, would be the order. The, uh, so, you know, the order was, was shifted to you know, just be a bit more logical in terms of grouping the types of information that's being conveyed within, um, uh, within the, the container naming the, uh, so kind of the, the first couple relates specifically to the, you know, the project and uh, that particular scale, the, uh, then moving on from that, the, uh, it's looking at the content, the that's with, that's within the container, 
then we have information about the container, the, and then information about the originator, and then ultimately a number that helps differentiate and make things a bit more unique when, when that becomes a challenge or to block out certain information in a logical format uh, with the number. The, um, the second thing that, that, that kind of is highlighted here is the, the one piece of data is relative to one field. The, um, so one kind of challenge that we have seen and we want to kind of address uh, is when we have a field that takes two pieces of data, combines them together, it adds to level of complexity the, uh, and the level of interpretation, a potential interpretation uh, that, that kind of deviates from its initial intent. The, so as kind of we see here, the, um, you know, maybe rather than just have something like location, the, we split that out, you know, into spatial zone and level. So, so then we're actually defining that um, explicitly using different components uh, rather than trying to merge two components together uh, and, you know, and potentially adding ambiguity to, uh, to the container naming system. Okay, the, um, so yeah, then the, the next area that we looked at, the well, or objective that we wanted to take a look at uh, was the metadata that's associated with the container. The, uh, so again, going back to the, the, the base standard, each information uh, container has to have a status, has to have a revision, and has to have a classification associated with it. Um, we, you know, again, it's the National Annex can't you know, deviate that, so we have to, you know, achieve what's what's needed and provide a bit of guidance uh, to to do that. The um, so the first thing I think people kind of when, when we're, whenever we're looking at any sort of standard, it's it's trying to see what's what's the standard trying to accomplish, or even in this particular case, this you know one section, uh, a couple of lines within in the standard and what it's trying to accomplish. The um, so it, it's when we're looking at the metadata. The, uh, you know, the, the question that, that is being asked really is, you know, how do I know that the information that's in this container is fit for purpose? Okay. And, and what it's using is those, that, that metadata, the status revision and classification, the, to, to you know, to, to answer that question. The, um, so kind of working from the top in terms of the, the status, the, um, you know, when we're looking at the status, you know, there's kind of two sub questions they really that, that need to be answered in order to really understand what the status of uh, an information container is. The so you know the, the first thing the you know is it accepted? You know has has somebody accepted it as something that uh, is relevant for sharing for you know for whatever its purpose actually is. The uh, so if we're, if we're looking at a particular piece of information or an information container, the and, and it's not accepted for a particular purpose, well then we know that it's not valid. The uh, where if it is accepted for a particular purpose, then we know yes, okay, then this information container is valid for a particular reason, and that's the the second component of this is why is it accepted? You know, so so in the national annex, we have it uh, as a status really being broken down into two components. So, you know, why basically, why is this piece of information being issued? The and identifying that by notifying what its purpose is, in our intended purpose is, and then also identifying has that been accepted? The, so by answering those two questions, we can then understand what the status is for, um, for this, for, you know, for, for the information container. You know, that's great. So we know what it is. We know if you know if it's if it's valid or not. But then, are we actually using the right version? You know of this. The um, that's where the revision code comes in. The um, so the you know, the revision code the in the national annex uh, is really you know using a numerical value the uh, to identify which version it is. The uh, what it's not doing is, is duplicating information. The whereas if the purpose you know, that we've identified in the metadata is for construction or for tender or for uh, a statutory sub submission, the, um, we're not going to replicate that information in the revision. Okay? And it goes back to uh, that principle of one piece of data relates to one, one field, or in this case, it's one piece of metadata. Again, if we start combining those two, we end up starting, you know, adding complexity, potential confusion, the, where the, you know, what's in the revision code may not necessarily reflect uh, exactly what the, the intended purpose is. The, um, and then also as purposes change, then all of a sudden, you know, the revision coding system, we want to be consistent as it goes. The, um, 
And then the last bit, again, to tie back into the requirement of the base standard uh, would be the classification. The uh, So am I using the correct type of container? The uh, So I know if it's accepted or not. I know if I have the right version, The uh, but this is the right type of, of, of container uh, for me. And that relates back to, to the classification system. The um, within the standard, or so within the national, both in the standard and you know we replicated it in you know in the assume assumptions in the national annex, is really all it has to do is comply with um, ISO uh, twelve zero zero six dash two, the uh, which is a framework for defining those types of classification systems. So as long as it uses a documented classification system, the um, that it, that is associated that complies with with the ISO. The, it would need, you know, be deemed, you know, acceptable within the national annex. The if we're trying to cover a wide variety of different uh, projects, uh, different projects would have different, uh, potentially different standards that they would follow for this classification role. The uh, so what's what's happening on would be kind of a, I'd say a typical residential project. The the classification system there may not be suitable for the uh, something that's used for. Um, uh, a power station, the uh, or some, or a highly engineered type of project, the or an infrastructure project. The, uh, so it's it's to give the flexibility to make sure as long as we're using a system that follows the ISO and is documented and relevant to that particular industry or sub industry, then you know would be deemed acceptable within the uh, terms of the, the national annex. Okay. The, um, so, so again, that we just want to thank everybody for the time. The um, and, and again, the, the the purpose of this was to highlight the objectives of the national annex, the um, as opposed to go through kind of each individual uh, item uh, in explicit detail. The um, be looking to you know for, for the NSI SAI the um, as the more appropriate forum for that. The and something will happen in, in, in due course in that particular item. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Rich, for the interesting presentation for the for introducing the Irish Annex. And we are going to go to our next speaker, who is Robert Moore, and he is going to talk about applying EIR and BEP according to ISO 19650. And I'm going to have a short uh, introduction to Robert. Robert Moore has been an information manager. A manager using BIM since two, uh, 2012 and has been involved in the AAC industry for over 25 years. His background is in the MEP sector where he has been working uh, for both design uh, consultancies and install contractors in a variety of practice types from small local firms to large multidiscipline multinational companies within Ireland and internationally in Germany, Australia and the UK. Uh, he has now moved to the client side in the public sector with the Grange Gorman Development Agency. Uh, Robert he is also a member of the NSAI and he is going to talk about uh, the topic we mentioned. Thanks uh, Robert to join and it's over to you. You might share your screen. Hi, how's everybody? And I'll just share my screen now. Yeah, sure. Okay, and I'll just start my presentation. Uh, just, in, well, get... just for the audience's information, we are going to answer and ask the question from the speakers at the Q&A session, which is after the force speak. Thanks, Robert, to you. Oh, okay, so just to continue on with my presentation, my presentation is applying information management according to ISO 19650 part two uh, to a project. So I just want to talk about what, where we're, we're, we're talking about. I work in Grange Gorman, I work for the GDA, Grange Gorman Development Agency, and we're developing the Grange Gorman campus. So the Grange Gorman campus is a campus on the north side of the city um, where, where we're developing a piece of city. So the campus itself is quite large, it's 30 hectares, and it's also very close to the centre of the city. Um, it's only 15 minutes to the spire, and also we're only 15 minutes walking away from Phoenix Park. So just to talk about, this is a, an image shown of the buildings that's coming up in the campus and what we're developing. I, 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 I'm in the campus today, I, I came into the campus for a meeting, and I can see there's a lot of buildings have been finished off in the last few months. Uh, it's really starting to come together. So what's our current program? 
So in the current programme that we're working on now, um, the blue buildings have been just completed or the design is starting on the, uh, at the moment. So just being procured. So th there's quite a number of buildings that were actively just receiving, handing over, and then going out for tender at the moment as well. But there's lots of small projects within the GDA, within Grange government as well. So just talk about who, who's the people. So I suppose on the campus, we have on the, uh, we have the Grange Government Development Agency people. We also work with um, Technological University Dublin people, and we also work with the HSE um, people. We also have design teams. We have multiple design teams because the way that we operate is um, each project is sent out. We don't have one central designer uh, and we tender out uh, and we get the design team for that. The same process works for con construction um, also for technical advisors and our employers representatives. So that means that we have a large number of teams. Some teams are tier one contractors. Some are very small design teams of, of a small uh, local office. So it means we have to collaborate with a lot of people and also we collaborate with the local people as well. So what I want to talk about information management according to ISO 19650. So I suppose really when people start off with the always start off with the old favourites, the uh, exchange information requirement and the BIM execution plan. Um, but there's also an other elements that's required too, and hopefully I'll dive into them a little bit as well after covering the exchange information requirements in the BIM execution plan. So just to start off with the exchange information requirements, it, simply put in plain language, it's a, a, a schedule of information required for decision making. So if we look into the, the exchange information requirements, how it's set out in ISO 19650, it's set out in, uh, in part 5.2.1, um, and it requires the information requirements in plain language, what and why is information needed, um, the level of information needed, uh, what is the minimum amount of information needed for the appointing party to accept the requirement, the um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, acceptance criteria, what conditions should be used to check the information deliverable uh, is consistent with, uh, as well as the consistent presentation and format. The supporting information that's needed, what supporting material is needed to produce the information and the information delivery date. So what, when is the information needed? So that's how, it, that's what it sets, sets out for uh, an exchange information requirement in the standard. Um, I, and then when we go and we look at the BIM execution plan, uh, it's the methodology of producing, managing and using of, of information. So what's set out in the standard itself? So in the standard, it talks about, um, it talks about information management functions. So who will be managing delivery of the information, the information delivery strategy, how will the appointing party, uh, appointed party approach preparing the deliverables, what will the final deliverables achieve, the, and the relationships between the teams, um, the federation strategy, which looks at how information containers are to be merged, the high level responsibility matrix, it talks about who's responsible, accountable, consultant and informed regarding the delivery of information containers, uh, the project information production methods and procedures, uh, is the methodology the appointing party will use to produce the deliverables, uh, it differs from the, if it differs from the appointing party's uh, information production methods and procedures and the information management sta information standard. Um, it's the um, proposed alternatives by the appointed party to the information um, consistency within the CDE. So they're the two elements, the two main elements, and I'll go on and explain them a bit more how we, we implement them. But just to understand what they are in plain language, I think is a, is a good start. Oh, sorry, and final, the schedule for, for software, which is detailed the proposed information te technology resources that will be used. So that goes through the kind of main things that's required uh, for, for um, the exchange information requirements and the BIM execution plan. Um, after appointment, 
all that's needed to do is is you need the 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 um, team that's been awarded the contract needs to conform the to confirm the information in the BIM execution plan, and if they need to make their own exchange information requirements for their um, for their supply chain, that can be done. But really, there's other elements there that we'll probably touch on that, that needs to be looked at as well before the um, before information can be produced towards um, ISO 19650. So how is how is um, how is uh, ISO 1960 uh, applied to to a project? So now we're going to look at how GDA will go and apply the things that we've talked about, and hopefully they'll start come clearer what what needs to be done. So how we how we do this is we, we use a um, an information management plan uh, to combine all elements of ISO 19650 into one place. So this is something that we've probably came up with ourselves to to, to use. Uh, it, it's basically we use um, a spreadsheet, um, and, and in that spreadsheet we have all the elements that we want in one place for the teams, for the appointed party, for us as the appointing party, and all the and the lead appointed party to find anything that they need. So within this Excel sheet, it, it goes through all the different areas that's needed, and and we just found it very useful to have everything in the one place. So just I'll go on and just give you an example of what this actually looks like. So basically we have an Excel sheet and the Excel sheet has a number of tabs that, that goes through the elements that we need and that we feel that we need to be compliant with ISO 19650. So just to go through them, um, we have a, a, a guidance sheet um, and also one of the elements here is the weighting. There's a possibility to put weighting in, in this to show what weighting is going to be used in the scoring. So that's part of the requirements. We also have, this is our template here at the moment, so it, it kind of has, um, it's not project compliant or it's not fully for a project. So what we put is the documentation that we send out. We then have Annex A, which is uh, part of uh, Annex A from ISO 19650 um, Part 2, which shows the responsibilities at a high level of who's responsible, responsible for the elements within ISO 19650. Um, then what we have is we have our um, exchange information requirements. We have one for services and one for works. As I said, this is a template. So what we'll do is we make it appropriate when we're sending it out for the projects. Um, what we've done is we've all the, the elements there that have went through uh, described. So you have the information requirements, the level of information needed, uh, acceptance criteria, supporting information and the frequency. So. We, we're working on filling in more of that as, as, we, as we bring out for a project. Uh, and then I'll just show you the works requirements. So now you can see in the level of detail, actually what we do is we refer to Capital Works Management Framework documents um, to, to supply some of the level of detail that's needed in the, uh, in the deliverables on the, on the work side. So that's how we kind of bring the two things together. Um, you can see that we have hyperlinks here to the acceptance criteria and supporting information, which are actually extra tabs on, on it. So within our document here, we, we list all the information that's of use to the teams um, when they're producing any of, any of their deliverables. And it's all hyperlinked that they can get access to the information very quickly. So it's about a single place that the, the hyperlinks work within our common data environments technology that they bring up any of the information they needed. Um, also here is what we call our acceptance criteria. So we go through how we want uh, information to appear. So there's, um, this is our information standards. This is an example of what we, we expect people to do regards um, X references. Uh, there was another one here around title blocks. So this shows what we expect, how our title blocks is filled in. Um, and also within this, we have our templates. So it's kind of bringing everything together for, for the project team, exactly what they need to know. Uh, then moving on to the next tab. The next tab here is about the functions. So this talks about the team that's going to be there. Who is actually going to be part of the team? Who is going to be uh, the, the contractual uh, arrangements between the people? Um, and then we have a, a, a tab here for the federation strategy. Uh, and we also have one here for the IT. Uh, resources, we, we're very keen that one thing is very, very important for us is to manage the maximum sizes of files. Um, that, that's kind of important. We've filed that we need to put that in um, 
would find it very useful. Uh, then we have a, a tab for the capacity and capability. And we also have uh, mobilization, so to add for a mobilization plan uh, and the risk register um, to talk about risks that's, that's with the project. So how we deal with the master information delivery plan, um, we struggle with it, I suppose, is, is, is kind of a to start off to be honest about how we do. So we look at it. So we, we the way that we've decided was the best way to get the res results we want was to split the concept of the master information delivery plan. Uh, that it should be a program for when deliverables will be done. And that's that's a program when models, areas of models will be finished and deliverables will be done. And then we have a schedule of deliverables of what we actually expect to see. Um, and this schedule, I'll just show you an example of a live one, uh, has hyperlinks to, to the actual deliverables themselves. So we just keep it fairly, fairly easy for people to navigate using um, filters here that can find the information they need quite quickly. Nearly there. Um, one of the last things, which is the important thing there, is the naming convention. This, we have the naming convention in the sheet because sometimes extra containers or volumes needs to be added in. So we need it flexible for the for the teams to add in the extra breakdown, spatial breakdowns they might need. But we 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 approve them themselves, and then we have some information standards then as well. So we talk about our quality. And then we talk about what we need for handover that but they're they're more our information standards so i suppose in a way that was kind of a, a quick whistle top tour to where where we are with our um how we imply implement it i'll just actually just go back to the presentation and then just continue on slightly so what we do that's what we've done was when iso 1963 came out we went and we we went out we looked at what what elements are there, but do we ask for them all at tender? The answer is no, we don't ask them for them all at tender. We think we're not there with our understanding and we'd also think the industry isn't there for its understanding. So there's no point in asking confusing questions and again, get more confused answers back. So what we've done is, what do we ask for a tender response? We've put it down into three simple things. We ask them to demonstrate their ability to deliver projects according to ISO 19650, which is, which is a piece, it's a, it's a problem in A4. And then we ask them to produce process maps to, to show us how they produce quality information um, to, for, for uh, the information deliverable. So that we found that very useful that when we went out for tenders that we're asking for process maps. It's, it's easier for us to review. I don't believe there's the areas for people to hide in with, with, with jargon and, and spiel. You need to know it shows what they actually plan to do. Uh, and then we also asked them to do uh, risk registers containing uh, any of the risks that they can see with the timely delivery of information, which are all, which is a question as part of ISO 19650. So just moving on. Um, do we ask for all elements? I suppose I, I kind of covered that. No, we don't. We, we, we find that we're learning, so we don't want to ask for something that we don't understand. So we think it's very important. Um, I think really what happened originally with EIRs and BEPs, templates came around and the templates were, 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 were just, there was no use behind them. They were over templated. So any BEP or EIR was just the same generic template with a different project number on it. So we, we're, we, what we want to do is we want to find the elements that we actually know what value we're adding and we get that value. So I suppose I've just covered it in that. Um, I'm nearly just finishing up here. What extra added value do we receive from ISO 19650 part two? Um, so I suppose um, we feel that the process to find in ISO 19650 um, makes sense to people. So when something makes sense to people, it can, it, it, it's easier for them to adapt, to implement. Um, working to an industry standard uh, reduces the work for people. If it's the same way if you're doing it, over and over again, it just makes it better. Uh, consistent information is easier for people to use for decision making. So it just means that people, especially when we get tenders back, if all the tenders come back and we, we uh, are in the same format, it's, it's easy for us to see who has a better approach or who, who's better understood our questions or who's came in a more innovative way um, to solve some of our problems. Uh, and 
people follow a similar workflow from project to project will increase quality. We see that uh, across the, the, the project now that we're repeating what we're doing. Um, between our design teams, not, uh, it, it is helping uh, the GDA staff and, and, and other people to increase the quality of work because we're working consistently. Uh, and just some final thoughts there. Uh, do people know what and why they're asking for information? Uh, people need to know what and why they're asking for information. It's very important to, to that. Uh, and people need to understand how this information uh, is used to add value. Um, as, uh, people need, need to keep it simple and include what they understand and then build on that. I think that's important. It, it does not, if you don't understand why you're asking for it, 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 you won't understand what's given back to you. So it, it's not worth asking. So go in and get into a template to ask for everything and the kitchen sink and it's not appropriate to your project is, is not really the way to go. It's go in and see what makes sense, see how you'll use that information and use that. Uh, sorry, there's a little bit of a um, misalignment here. Um, and make sure it's not a box ticking exercise. Managing information ensures people have reliable information and people need the right information to make the right decision. So I think that all them things come from working with a workflow from a project according to ISO 19650. Uh, and just finally, I, I, I would like to say we don't have all the answers. I, I, we are just learning as well. But we'd like to think that we're starting to ask better questions. So thanks very much um, for my presentation and um, I hope if there's any questions afterwards. Thanks very much, Robert, for the interesting uh, presentation and uh, talking about the benefits of using this standard. And now we are going to start with our fourth speaker, who is Ralph Montague, and he is uh, going to talk about the challenges for implementation of the ISO 19650. And I'm going to have a short introduction to him. Ralph uh, Montague is the director of ArcDocs, a specialist BIM consultancy practice based in Dublin, uh, providing professionally managed advice, production support, and training services to the construct uh, construction property industry. A registered architecture with almost 30 years experience in managing large projects, Ralph nurses BIM as a more cost-effective and highly effective efficient way of producing and managing design and construction documentation and improving the building process. Ralph is the current chairperson for the uh, Technical Mirror Committee in NSAI, and I'm going to hand it over to Ralph to have his presentation. Thanks, Ralph, is to you. Thanks, Sora, and thanks, everyone. Um, really great presentations. Yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the challenges of uh, that, I, that we've been seeing in, in the marketplace um, around the implementation of ISO 19650. So just as a quick recap, maybe I'll touch on what Michael uh, spoke about. But the, when we look at the information management process, there's, it's obviously the process involves a lot of activities and some of those activities um, are associated with the design stage and, and also the construction stage. So it's important to see those as two separate appointments, if you like. Um, within that, there's information, the information has to be procured. So there's a procurement of information that has to occur. Then there's a planning stage where you plan what you're going to do. And then finally, there's the production stage. So I think that's um, important to, to understand. Obviously, if you want to procure information, you first need to know what it is you want to procure. And I think what, that's what Rob was talking about. You need to define your, your need for information. You have to then issue that as an invitation to tender for either design or construction services. Um, you then get the tender response. And you know, based on that, you would, you would uh, select your preferred um, designers or contractors. You uh, go through the appointment process. Um, and then mobilization before you start. And then finally, you know, you get to the production of the information. And I, you know, I think that's, that's kind of a key point is that's where the work starts at stage six. But uh, all the stuff from stages one to five has to happen before the work starts. And um, you know, that, that'll bring me on to one of my first challenges. Then of course, the, the the information has to be delivered. So at the end of design stage, the information gets delivered. 
and then that design information then feeds into the invitation to tender for construction. Uh, and then finally, the project gets closed out at, uh, at the end, okay? So these are the responsibilities, who has to do what in terms of all these, these activities. Um, and you can see, I suppose, that there's a lot of activities up front from the appointing party or the client, employer or developer, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and then as you move through you know, those, uh, the, the responsibilities to perform those actions or those activities uh, change to various parties. So a couple of the, when you're looking at this diagram, a couple of the kind of key things that stand out for me anyway as challenges is definitely the stages one and two. Like it's been our experience in the industry that most projects begin without a proper assessment of the need uh, and all the documentation that, that Rob and uh, Michael were talking about, this, uh, the, the exchange information requirements, et cetera. Uh, so projects tend to launch into early design, concept design stage without any of that, that stuff being put in place. Um, so people are appointed without knowing what they are meant to provide. Another key area we've discovered in, in practice is a lot of people don't like to spend a lot of time planning, you know, or, or what they're going to do. They just want to get, get down and do the work and get paid. And uh, so the, the whole area of going through the, the, the processes outlined in stage four, when you, you're making appointments and also mobilizing the project team seems to be skipped. And the, the third kind of key area that we see is there's an assumption in this diagram that the design information would neatly progress from stages two to seven, uh, and then the completed design information would be handed off for a contractor to tender on, and, you know, and then that they would work through in, in the production of the construction information. But of course, anybody who works in this industry will know that's, that's not the case on most projects. In most projects, the development of the design information and the development of the construction information is often happening, happening in tandem uh, with, you know, to accommodate value engineering exercises, uh, late changes, etc. So, um, you know, so it doesn't work as neatly as this diagram might suggest. So if we look briefly at the challenges so the stage one and the assessment of need these are the things that need to uh, be completed and i'm not going to read through those uh, i think michael and, and rob have have uh, dealt with those um what i want to talk about is really just the challenges so i mean the definitely one of the biggest challenges we see is that these activities are meant to occur before going out to tender for design and construction services but typically that's not the case. These are often ignored in the early phases of design, you know, particularly in feasibility and concept design stage, and you know, often are only addressed when the project comes, uh, come, uh, is going out to tender for construction. Um, another challenge is the, the level of understanding and knowledge and skill and expertise within the appointing party organizations, or even if they, take on project managers and other consultants in the pre-design stage, though, even those advisors don't have the, the, the required knowledge and understanding to, to actually fulfill these activities. And, um, and the third thing is the difficulty in trying to define information requirements at these early stages for something that hasn't been designed yet. So you know, it's very difficult to, to go into a lot of detail about what your information requirements are for a building that doesn't that hasn't been designed. So solutions to this challenge, I think will include um, providing some industry standard guidance and advice notes and templates, and even uh, maybe even some technology tools that will assist the appointing parties to fulfill these obligations in a consistent way. I, I think for the industry, it would be you know, it would be terrible if every appointing party came up with their own way of defining this uh, this need because that that would still make it very difficult for industry to respond so uh, i suppose the question there is who is going to produce this this uh, industry's wide standard and guidance i know the rai uh, have attempted to do that but um, 
but yeah, I suppose that's yeah, that's just addressing the needs of architects rather than the whole industry. The second stage is the invitation to tender. And again, these are the actions that have to be performed again, all by the appointing party. Some of the challenges, yeah, are that that we see are that the exchange information requirements or the EIR are very seldom produced before tendering for design services. So on most projects, the EIR isn't available at those very early stages. Um, also, the assemb assembling the reference information typically forms part of the design services. So clients usually appoint the team and then wait for the team to ask them what information they want and often get the team to go and carry out surveys and various, uh, various inf um, information ga gathering exercises. Um, I think there's also a reluctance on many appointing parties to evaluate you know, on the BIM capability of the teams because they feel that that might limit the numbers of companies that would uh, tender on the project. And you know, they, they seem to be more interested in getting the cheapest price than getting the right capability to um, execute their project. And again, the level of understanding expertise within the appointing party to, to fulfill these activities is, is either non-existent or quite low. So again, I think the solutions are pretty similar to what I said in the first one about pro uh, providing um, a sort of an industry-wide consistent approach to, to carry, fulfilling these activities. The third uh, stage is the tender response. And these are the activities that have to be uh, carried out. These, are, these will be carried out by the prospective lead appointed party and, and prospective task teams that are tendering on the project. Um, again, what we see in practice is these activities that should in, in theory um, occur during the tendering process for design and construction services. And they should have occurred before the appointment, but typically these are ignored till in the early stages of design and, and sometimes only addressed in, when coming up to construction phase. Um, same uh, same uh, point, I suppose, when it comes to the industry that are uh, tendering on delivering projects, uh, the lack of understanding, knowledge and skill to fulfill these activities within the industry is a challenge. Uh, and again, I think the solution is similar that, you know, the industry needs um, needs to be provided with project specific or industry standard guidance or advice notes or templates or tools as part of the tender information pack. So one of the things that appointing parties or clients can do is you know, understand that the industry might be not be ready to respond and give them the required um, templates or tools or whatever to to help uh, i think rob uh, demonstrated what gdda are doing in a in a great way in that in that regard okay but the the idea is to get consi a consistent way for people to respond a across multiple projects in the industry to to facilitate a consistent evaluation of tenders and then stage four is the appointment um these are the activities that have to take place, uh, a lot of it through the lead appointed party, um, but also confirming the appointment with by the appointing party. The challenges we, we see here again are that these activities are meant to occur during the final negotiation and appointment of the design and construction services, but often these are you know, left after the appointment and once the work has commenced. And um, yeah, you know, that causes that causes problems because you you're appointing somebody without finalizing these things, and then it's difficult to come back and uh, renegotiate the the terms of that appointment. Uh, again, the level of understanding is is a big issue uh, amongst all parties to fulfill these acti activities. Uh, the answer is pretty pretty similar. You know, the the industry does need some consistent way to fulfill these obligations on multiple projects and it, and it shouldn't be you know different for every project because that you know that sort of defeats the purpose of standardization um, i think there's definitely opportunities here to establish um, or recognize digital tools or technologies that support the production of eirs beps and responsibility matrix and i think 
yeah, what Rob demonstrated, what the GDA are doing with the Excel tool is a start of that, but I suppose Excel is a, although it's a desktop tool that most people can use, um, there might be more um, sophisticated solutions that are web-based and uh, don't rely on a, a desktop application. The first uh, item is mobilization. And these are the activities that have to occur. The lead appointed party has to get everything ready. Um, challenges we see here is that the mobilization of resources and technology are typically uh, implemented on an as needed basis on projects. So they're not sort of said, uh, put in place at the very beginning of a project. And often they purposely left to uh, as late as time possible to uh, avoid any financial commitments and uh, to avoid early engagement, which, which is challenging uh, because you should get all this in place before you start. Another issue is that project teams, are up, when they come to this stage, they're often straddling the, the process of closing out previous projects and commencing new projects. So it's not as if they were waiting around for two or three months for the project to start. You know, they're trying to finish off other projects. So the time to, to put things in place is, is, uh, is often not there. And also any skill gaps that are recognized in the BIM cap capability assessments are not being addressed through um, you know, lack of uh, input of time or resources into upskilling. And, and then the testing methods and procedures, um, you know, sorry, the testing of methods and procedures is very seldom done. You know, and often that's left to the, a very late uh, time just before delivery has to occur. So, um, and possibly that's because the full delivery team is not in place at the start of the project. The delivery team sort of uh, joins the project, um, as I said, at, at the latest time possible. So solutions to this, I think um, it would be helpful if um, during this appointment and the mobilization stage that each of the, the delivery team that are going to be appointed submit um, a small sample of information as part of this, this stage of that appointment to, to test the capability and production methods and procedures, uh, even if their, their work is gonna be started, um, their, their main body of work is gonna be started a couple of months later, at least they, in the beginning, they all participate in some testing uh, of, of the procedures. The stage six, the, this is where the actual work gets done, the collaborative production of, of information between the delivery team. The challenges we see here is um, a lot of the time is spent gathering reference and resource information at this stage when that should have really been provided at the beginning of the project when the teams were assessing their service and, and tendering. Um, and um, also, as I mentioned earlier, the we see that on just about every project, the design development and the construction development are happening in tandem rather than uh, one after the other. And um, yeah, that's causing a lot of issues. Again, the level of understanding and skill and expertise within the, the industry to generate quality, high level quality of information through BIM um, is still a, a challenge. Um, like you'll have very good companies, but on a typical project, you could have 30, 40, 50, even 100 different contractors and subcontractors. And within that mix of companies, there'll be a very, a very varied level of uh, expertise. Um, another challenge we see is there's no standardized method or methodology for checking the quality of information and checking tends to be quite manual and subjective. Um, so solutions to this, I think some standardized procedures and even some supporting digital tools or technologies that uh, support the consistent production of quality information and the checking of, of information in a, in a uh, more consistent way to ensure the trustworthiness of the information would be really helpful. Um, delivering the information model, these are the tasks that have to be carried out. The challenges we see here is that submitting and approving the information models uh, doesn't happen at sort of one point in time. It happens over an extended time in a very sporadic fashion and trying to keep track of that is, is quite difficult. The, again, the level of understanding and skill within the project team to, 
to actually check and validate information um, is is quite low and and often people uh, you know the party producing the information is meant to check their own information and you know there's a sort of sort of assumption that they've done that nobody else is checking or cross-checking that and uh, and nobody else feels it's their duty to to check other people's information so very often things are getting lost uh, there's so there's no standardized methodologies um, for checking in the quality of information and and Checking is very a very tedious and labor-intensive task, uh, which is quite subjective as well. And you know, some in a similar way, I think some standardized procedures and tools and technologies that would support the the um, the checking of of quality information in a more consistent way would be helpful. And particularly if the delivery team and the the appointing party were using the same tools to check, so. You know, that the delivery team know what the result of the check by the appointing party would be before they submit the information. And lastly, the the project closeout. Um, the challenges we see here is again the level of understanding and skill, uh, and even expertise within the appointing party organization to to determine how the information model is going to be used and kept up to date going forward. Um, often the the people involved in pro in capital projects in organizations are not the same people that are involved in the future operations of the project and um, you know and they don't have that sort of vested interest in the long-term use of information um, in, in the, the asset management phase or operational phase of, of projects and um, also the lessons learned you know the, and the post occupancy evaluations, it's been our experience, but we may be wrong, it might just be the type of projects we're on. But these are very seldom carried out. And if they are carried out, they, um, you know, they're not properly documented or distributed to future teams. So, it's, uh, you know, I've hardly ever seen on a project in all my career where at the start of a project, the client gives you, you know, a book of, yes, the lessons learned, we, le we learned from the last five projects. And could you, uh, consume that and make sure you don't make the same mistakes. So, yeah, it's, I think on most projects, people are just left to make the same mistakes over and over again. So solutions to this, um, I really believe in BS 8536 and the principles set out in that uh, for designing and constructing buildings with performance and outcomes in mind. And, um, you know, particularly for the future facilities management and you know, these principles should be incorporated into capital projects at the earliest stage and the you know the post occupancy evaluation reports and lessons learned should definitely be shared with future teams in in some sort of manner so conclusions um i, I think at the moment i the way i saw 19650 part two is structured it's too generic um it's it's written to deal with anything from a house extension to a major uh, city uh, block or whatever and uh, it's open to a lot of bespoke implementations by different people which works against the principle of standardizing procedures for consistency to help the industry um, re uh, respond in a consistent way to be more productive so it, you know, every project tends to be a new adventure uh, and a different way of doing things which which isn't helping um, quality information, and by quality information, I mean information that's accurate, uh, uh, delivered on time, it's accessible to people, it's well organized, should be seen as a valuable asset in itself. And because it drives better performance and outcomes on projects, in other words, it reduces the time, costs, and risks, and it improves the productivity, the quality, the safety, sustainability. However, it's been our experience that this fact isn't fully appreciated in the industry and there's a there's a lot of focus on delivering the physical asset or the physical building or piece of infrastructure and doing that for the cheapest price and in in the process of focusing on that losing um, focus on the value that information brings to that process and and therefore just about every project ends up over over budget and over time so 
I think the procurement, the planning and the production of information has to be carefully managed from start to finish. And as you can see from the diagram we started with, there's a lot of work that has to go, has to go be done up front to make sure that this works properly and, and you know, it's not going to happen by accident. Uh, a high level of understanding and knowledge and skill is, is required by all parties that are participating in digital construction projects. Uh, and you know, I think very often people are appointed to projects not because of the skill capability they have in participating in a digital project, but because maybe they're the cheapest price or the only available uh, uh, provider. And the, I think it's true to say that if you don't follow the process, you can't expect the outcomes that uh, to be achieved. So there's no shortcuts. I think as Michael pointed out in his talk, uh, you can't so take big chunks of the, the process and just eliminate them. Uh, and lastly, I think industry needs more detailed and less generic standardized procedures and tools that support the clearly specifying information requirements and also checking the quality of that information that's being delivered in a consistent way and more often to assure the, the, the trustworthiness of the information model. So, Thanks very much. If you want to get hold of us, there are our contact details. Thanks very much, Rolf, for the interesting presentation on the challenges for implementation of this standard. And now we have a number of questions to different speakers, and I'm going to go through the questions shortly and asking the speakers to answer the questions. And also we have had some repeated questions and just I'm going to summarize some of them. We are going uh, to start with a question from John Egan related to the um, uh, first speaker uh, to uh, Michael. And it's going to say that uh, when establishing project information production methods and procedures, uh, to what extent do you define how the CPE is set up? Are you defining user permissions, um, document uh, attributes, etc., Michael? Yes, uh, yeah, we do have a, a CD procedure and how it's set up. And uh, I would say it's probably changed over time. Um, and it's to do with uh, how we structure the information. So initially it was very much um, each company got a space on the CD and uh, we talked about what information they're producing and how they want to structure that information on the common data environment. But every project is different. Um, uh, if you're just doing buildings and buildings of a certain size, things might be a bit more straightforward. We're doing runways one day, we're doing campus roads the next, uh, another day, then we're doing a, a building, you know, a snow-based building or something like that. So it's, um, it's not the same for every project. So it's, uh, but we try to standardize it as much as possible. Um, what we are doing in the common data environment is trying to set up our handover sort of structured information as quickly as possible. <clears throat> so look, look ahead and see how we want the information at the end and set up all that structure for that. And that tends to be divided into so what we call a safety file part and, a, and an operations and, and a maintenance part. And then generally we have a section then to do with how we manage the projects. So we'd have a section on quality, a section on environmental, a section on health and safety and so on. And we'd set out who's responsible for uh, putting that information there. So we're starting to look at, at the CD on a role-based basis. So what the PSTP has to do, what the assigned certifier has to do, what the PSCS has to do and so on. And uh, we did in the beginning, we're a little bit more open about letting companies or individuals and companies upload the information, but I think it got difficult to manage. Um, and we're very much now trying to say, you know, you're responsible for uh, reviewing the information and putting up that information. The, so the PSCP has got a, quite a, um, a big role in the way our projects are run now. Um, so I'd say it's it's ever changing and evolving and improving. Um, but uh, I'd say we've moved towards a very much a, a role-based um, management of the common data environment, but we are trying to standardize it. And we do have a document that sets out um, <clears throat> all the folders and uh, that we would typically need on a project. But I would say every project has some 
little differences uh, between them. So. Thanks, Michael, for the answer. And I'm just hope hopeful that John Egan uh, could hear the answer. I'm going to ask the rest of the questions later from Mike. And then uh, we have some comments and questions related to the Irish Annex. Uh, it goes to Rich. And then uh, the, the first comments is that the UK is leading the global information management industry. Why would Ireland go off on a tangent with an uh, annex, considering the two countries are so connected in terms of projects, companies, standards, and staff? Ireland does not need to use a new annex for the sake of it, just uh, copy the UK annex and uh, save cost, time, and effort. And also, there has been one more comment from John Dillon. Information containers with uh, varying field uh, quantities are difficult to manage in a CDE, EDMS, or any other management system. A standard should be a standard and not deviate based on applicability. If it's not applicable, it's just get uh, not applicable, but keep the quantities consistent. These are mostly um, the comments. And then we have a question from uh, Shoban Monali, and she is saying something similar. And she has a question indeed. And uh, it says that why we are not using the uh, UK uh, annex and what are the benefits? Uh, what are, I'm going to the question exactly, what are the perceived benefits of value out of implementing these changes over what would be considered an already well-established system, e.g. difference in file naming structure and containers, use of purpose and acceptance or uh, status codes, and no prefix or preliminary uh, versioning for revision numbering. I think, uh, Rich, you might just uh, have uh, your answer to this comments and question. Sure. The, um, <clears throat> let me look for first thing. The, uh, the Irish market is a different jurisdiction than, than, than the UK. So just as uh, if anyone's working in France or Germany or anywhere else, the uh, the applicable standards would be applicable to those those projects. The, um, you know, look in relation to the similarities and differences, the, uh, we, what we've looked to do in the Irish Annex was to clarify some of the some some of the issues that we've seen with the use uh, of, of the UK uh, National Annex and PES 1192 system. The um, it, why we've taken that kind of one piece of data, one field, or one piece of metadata approach. The uh, again is to be very explicit and clear uh, on on those particular items. The, um, so it's looking to reduce kind of risk that we've seen creep into the implementation uh, of, of, of standards. The, um, uh, and again, in terms, in terms of the order that there would be kind of experience and, and comments that we have received uh, throughout kind of the, you know, the, the working groups uh, careers, the, uh, where we, we've seen challenges being faced uh, by every system. I mean, I think no, no system is going to be perfect. The, um, but at the same time, it's looking to continuously improve on, on, on good work that's been done the, um, and, and trying to take that to, to, to another level of, of clarity um, and, and mitigating the risks associated uh, with you know, what we've seen. The, I think in terms of, of, of was it the, the, the order and the, the standard is the standard, the, um, the order is, is, is there in, in the National Annex. The, uh, you know, this is kind of nowhere does it say, you know, chop and change the, uh, for what you, what, you, what, you, what you need. The, in terms of the optional fields, the, uh, you know, we would see that happening on a, a decision happening on a project basis where uh, the, the, if, if the project requires the, the additional fields, they would have those in there. If a project would not benefit and does not have those, uh, those particular fields being valid for it, and they would be omitted, but that would be for the over the project as opposed to, you know, thing, things move a moving target uh, for, for the information container, um, information container naming. The, um, and I, I think they're just on, on the, the last point was uh, related to the, the revision codes and things like that. Uh, I think that that's kind of another example where we, you know, we've seen the, um, a lot of ambiguity and a lot of different interpretations. 
the and <laughs> quite a few emails the uh, kind of over the as information progresses and potentially kind of comes in a new cycle of revisioning the uh, that the the prefix causes you know, you know again a bit a bit of a challenge uh, which again we've looked to to, to, to mitigate the, that risk by kind of adding the purpose code the so and decoupling that from the revision code the uh, so that we can have a clean progression of revisions as well as uh, the, the metadata associated with uh, the, the purpose, uh, fulfilling the need to provide a clear understanding of the kind of the, the status uh, of, the, um, of the information container. Thanks very much, Rich. And I'm hopeful that uh, John and Shoban, they got the answer to their questions and their comments. And now we have a question to Robert on Grand Gorman. Is the information on each building kept separate with on CDE or is there a single whole Grand Gorman CDE? That's the question to you, Robert. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I, I suppose just from reading that question or hearing that question, um, I kind of, it, it sounds to me like they're, they're attributing CDE with technical solution. And we would see the CDE, uh, uh, the technical solution as one part of the CDE. So if, if we talk about it, the CDE is based of, the, of a few components. One is a workflow and the workflow, there's a single workflow for producing information that guarantees quality over the Grange Goldman project. Also just consistency of that information. So we, all the information is produced using uh, one uh, or multiple information standards to say how we do different things. So we have an information standard um, uh, on naming, we have an information standard about how our title blocks are done and, and information. So we have consistent information across the campus and that's quite important for us and that's, that's one of our biggest challenges because we have so many different teams working on the campus to make sure that they, they provide consistent information. So just to give you an example is we've different, we work, we, some of the campus will be HSC and some will be TU Dublin. So when TU Dublin estates go into a building, we can't, every building must be, the information must be the same. It can't be, oh, that was a different way of doing it. But to talk about technical solutions, we have multiple technical solutions that make up the common day environment that we manage. Uh, these technical solutions are divided um, usually around suitability. So we, we provide a technical solution that has the published, approved, or, or the accepted information, but work in progress information can be provided, uh, the technical solution can be provided by the appointed party or the lead appointed party. So I don't know, does that clear it up or uh, have I added confusion uh, more? But I suppose we, we, we do not equal common day environment and technical solution. Uh, we see them as not the same thing. It's an element of the common day environment. Thanks very much, Robert, for the answer. I'm just hopeful that Colm got the answer to his question. Thank you. And then I assume that we have a question which goes to uh, Rolf. And the question is that when will the RIAI members' public BIM packs be updated to reflect ISO 1965? 50. Is this process even in, progr uh, in progress? That's probably a question for Michael, I would say. Sorry, I was just responding to another uh, uh, point online there. Well, can you repeat the question, please? Just yeah, it's, it's that uh, uh, when will the RIAI member oh, yeah. impacts be updated? Yeah, uh, I'm working on that at the moment. It's uh, taking a little bit longer than I'd hoped. Uh, there's uh, there's a bigger difference between PAS 1192 and ISO 19650 than uh, I think we had initially thought. Um, so what we've done is we've done one document uh, that's been included in the tendering code of practice in the RIAI. Uh, so that's going into the updated document. I'm doing we're doing three documents at the moment. I'm going to release those first. One is the, um, it's a, a guide to tendering uh, using ISO 19650. And it, uh, some of the points in this presentation will be covered in a lot of detail in that document. And uh, 
we're, we're completing two other documents and one is a guide for uh, SMEs for BIM and uh, the other one is a, a guide to file naming. So um, we want to issue those in draft first to uh, the other various institutes, so ACEI, uh, SCSI and so on, uh, just for their comments because we want to get a little bit more engagement with them to say this is what we, our guidance we want to put out there. Have you got any comments on that? And then we'll issue out the, um, the final documentation. So I have, <clears throat> I suppose, final drafts that need uh, some review at the moment before, and I want to do that before the next uh, committee meeting. And, um, and then we'll get them out to the uh, professional bodies and then out to the public after that. Um, uh, but it's uh, it's just a lot a lot in it, and there's a lot more in one nine six five zero than uh, I think we'd originally thought at the beginning. And it's only when you start getting into it and using it and doing it that you start to realise it's um, there's a lot in it. It's uh, from start to finish, it's a, a significant exercise. It covers everything from uh, tendering to production to handover and. Um, uh, and every part of that <coughs> has pretty much been changed as part as part of the 19650 standard. Uh, some things remain the same. I was just looking through some of the documentation. <coughs> we set out one document that set out all the different information types. Uh, <coughs> that really hasn't changed. Um, you know, there we can add some things onto that, but it's a, I think that's quite a good document. But the tendering process has changed. There's no more information manager. There's an information management function. Uh, uh, 19650 so it clearly defines that there's a <clears throat> there's some work to be done by the client and there's also some work to be done by the delivery team and that's split now into sort of uh, quite defined sections um the uh we know a lot more now about the cde and how that runs uh, so that document needs to be updated and <clears throat> again i think it's clearer now as well that it's the client's responsibility to set up the CD. That wasn't clear, I think, in the PAS 1192 document. Uh, and often it was the actual delivery team who did that. So it's um, so there's been a lot of clarifications, I suppose, with the 19650, and we just need to get those through into the standards document. Uh, so that first document is going to come out. That sort of it's called at the moment uh, bidding on a BIM project, but it's really a bit more about how to tender well and how to uh, respond to a tender for BIM project. Yeah, I'm keen to get that out as quickly as possible and in the next two to three weeks uh, to hopefully have that in a draft document that will be distributed to um, uh, the various sort of professional bodies and anyone else who's interested in commenting on those documents. So. It might be worth saying as well, Rob, um, you worked with the, the SEN committee on some guidance for EIRs and BEPs, and yeah, that's due to be released soon, isn't it? Yeah, no, uh, the final the final version I, I, I was sent around there a couple of days ago, so I would hope that it would be released um, before the end of the year uh, and yeah. available for people. Okay. Thanks very much. And uh, Ralph, back to you. Uh, there is a question that we have uh, been seeing that you have been reporting some challenges for the ISO 19650 and also suggested some solutions. Uh, the question is that, do we have any follow-up plan to go and come up with some type of uh, collection of this solution in place for the industry? Who's we? The, the industry? <laughs> Maybe the, because you are also <laughs> the chairperson for the uh, technical well, committee and yeah. plan. Well, so just to be clear, the NSAI technical committee is not uh, doesn't produce tools and templates, and you know, its its role is only to to monitor the the standards that are being produced internationally and at a European level and make contributions to those where necessary from an Irish point of view. So there's no function. In the NSI to develop tools, you know. So I, th I think the development of tools has to come from industry, and yeah, you know, that means the committees like the RII committee, the the engineers committee, the CIF, and and various other participants um, have to talk to each other and, and come up with a a consistent approach. 
so you know um, I think every that's probably one of the problems is everybody's expecting somebody else to do the work where you know I think uh, everybody has to get involved if you're interested in this in the subject and you're interested in an industry that performs better and uh, you know, people have to make their contribution and um, and add to 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 the solution uh, and there's and there's opportunity. So for for people who want to find the opportunities to develop tools and and processes, uh, even on a commercial basis, that, yeah, that's I think that's an opportunity for people. So, but yeah, there's nobody there's nobody outside of the industry that's going to solve the problems for the industry. The industry has to solve its own problems. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I would say is it's it's. Um... It is about information management. I mean, you know, BIM is a kind of a, a nice term, um, easy to say, but yeah, this this the challenge here is information management in construction, and uh, it's uh, it needs a lot of work to get it uh, uh, into a digital format um, that's efficient. It's neither efficient nor it's starting to become digital, but it's it's. Um, getting it efficient is uh, going to require planning. And I think one of the things Ralph mentioned earlier is that um, industry is not very good at planning. I uh, concur with that. Um, there we seem to have uh, lost <laughs> some skills in planning. Um, even trying to get task information delivery plans like Robert, I think um, was mentioning earlier, is very difficult. It's, trying to, it's very difficult to try and get people to say, uh, this is what I plan to deliver. Um, can we discuss before uh, I submit all this information or have my team work on that information? Um, there needs to be a lot more of that. Uh, that's, if we did that alone, I think uh, it would improve the process uh, greatly. Uh, but just to your point there, Michael, I think the current, the status quo of the industry working with poor information mm. is probably more difficult than trying to standardize and organize information you know, in a digital format. Yeah. So yeah. You know, like the firefighting and the dealing with rework and abortive work and you know, all the, the challenges that, that people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis because of poor information is probably more difficult than getting it right. So. As difficult, <laughs> as difficult as, as digitizing and organizing it is, mm. it's probably less difficult than doing it badly. Yeah. And I don't think people set out to produce bad information. I think there's just a lot of um, sources of that information and it needs to uh, work together. Um, so it, it needs, it's not just models that need to come together. It's uh, documentation. It's, you know, it's technical documentation. It's... Um, it, uh, it's surveying, it's clash avoidance, it's um, tests, it's inspections, it goes on and on. There, there's got to be a collaboration uh, between people and uh, there's got to be standard methodologies and how things are done. And uh, uh, yeah, the industry knows, you know, there's a lot of people out there with good experience and knowledge. Um, and I would say um, that the people who know how to do it need to work with the people who know the technical or the digital side of things to make it better um, uh, because this requires um, people with on the ground experience um, to make things better. Um, it's not going to be some super, um, someone's going to come down and uh, uh, with systems to make it better. It's too, comp too complex for that, I believe. Thanks very much and uh, just I'm going time-wise and need to go to the close of the session and then I'm going to have a question to all of the speakers and it would be appreciated if you could go for the short answers. Uh, do the panel think that the differences in the naming protocol from the past to the Irish National Annex will hinder understanding of BIM, BIM container identification, particularly for those in known BIM roles. Could we start with uh, the answers from maybe Michael? These short answers, thank you. Okay, um, yes, I think it's confusing for people in non-BIM roles. Um, 
there's always a, an education, I think, when, you're, when you've when you got a, a file naming standard. Uh, I think it's important for each company that uh, um, wants to look after their assets and have them named in a certain way to write down how they want that and to do a very simple uh, one pager if they can to say, this is our adoption of the standard or our, our deviations from it and to, to, edu to have uh, in their training sessions to say, this is how we want files named uh, from the very start. Um, and everyone needs to be clear on that and needs to be put into the project protocol as well so that uh, there's a requirement for everyone to do that. And Rich, could we have your answer? Thanks, Mike. No, I, I think the, the question is the, the change from PEST to, to a different standard. The um, look, the intention was to, to clarify some of the challenges that, that came from the implementation or the attempted imp implementation of, um, of, of, of the PEST standard. So the, I would say that the, if, there's an, if there's a challenge, it's the same for both. The, um, and then that, that the new standard will, would, again, intend on, on alleviating that by making sure that one piece of, uh, one field, one piece of data is, is aligned with each other and that we're not crashing and combining two different things. I mean, even, even the UK annex wasn't perfect and they've recently updated it as well. So, you know, it's not as if the, the original UK annex was absolutely perfect. Even the, even the UK have admitted that by changing it. Thank you. And Robert, could we have your answer as well? So um, I suppose like the point of the part of the question that I'd like to concentrate on is that people that are not in this so-called BIM or, uh, or sphere looking at the naming conventions, uh, we experience that quite a lot. Like every document that's given to us should, must, I should say must, be named to our naming convention. Uh, and, and we experience a lot of pushback from small um, providers of information, like they might be, they might do, uh, they might have one report that they, they just have to deliver to us, and we we have to tell them that we don't accept a report until it is named as our name in convention. Um, and there's a huge pushback saying that that doesn't suit us because we've our own, we've our, our, our internal way of naming stuff, which usually is Grange Government report or whatever. We know we're Grange Government. We don't want to see that in the name, name again. So I suppose having non, uh, well, I use the word BIM, which I, I kind of don't like using, but people that are not in, involved in it, um, they, they need to understand that the naming convention complies to every document that's, in, that's uploaded to the common date environment. It must conform to the, to the common date environment standard methods and procedures. Thanks very much, Robert, for your answer. And Ralph, could we have your answer as well to this question? Well, if, if someone's in a non-BIM role and they're not used to either annex, then it wouldn't make a difference because you know whether it's one or the other, it's, it's a standardized way. I think having a standardized way of doing something is, is definitely beneficial to everyone because otherwise every project you spend three hours arguing about how you're going to share and uh, organize your information. So you know, to eliminate that sort of constant argument would be beneficial to everyone, even, even people that are in non-BIM roles. Uh, so they've got to get used to it. It's, I often describe the file naming convention like a number plate on a car, a license plate. You know. We all understand, if you live in Ireland, you, you understand how the license plate works and what the different codes mean. And you know, a car drives past you in two seconds, you understand where the car came from, what year it was registered, you know, et cetera. So it's like that. It takes a bit of, bit of getting used to, but once you're used to it, it saves so much time in getting through information. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ralph, for the answer. And thanks to all the participants to the webinar and also for your questions. There has been more questions. We are going to direct the questions to the speakers. In case we are receiving the answers, we will be in contact with you and we will provide you the answers to the rest of the questions. And now back to the IVI. In IVI, we are organizing the workshops, webinars, and get in touch with us through 
the, through LinkedIn, Twitter, and also you can send us um, emails through information at ivi.ie. I, and then there are sort of opportunities of collaboration with IVI. You, we could work with you and to apply for the national and international funding and uh, to have projects defined between us, join us for this. And also there is a possibility to work with IVI through membership scheme. Uh, look at the IVI, you could find the join us and through that link, you could apply for the membership at IVI. Thanks again to our all uh, four speakers. Thanks to take your time and thanks to all the participants. Have a nice evening and thank you to all. Bye everybody. Thank you.